Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Huma book launch seminar series. Uh, I'm really, really um, happy to be hosting today researcher Malak Khil, who is the co-founder of the literary magazine Asamina, and her first novel written in French, Valse de Silence, which translates to Walls of Silence, Walls of Silences, published this year, will be the topic of uh, our discussion today. This seminar series is actually a space for discussing critical work written by Africans on Africa. And this seminar is hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa, which is um, located at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And um, there are actually several questions which we attempt to engage with here at HUMA, notably what it means to be human in Africa today through the multiple frontiers of public and intimate experiences. And um, my name is Amina Slimani, and I'm a doctoral research fellow here at HUMA. And I really want to welcome you all on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Azza Mustafa and Minentlin Kube, with whom this seminar is co-organized, as well as on behalf of our director, um, Divine Fuh. Um, with us today is also uh, Sana al Wazn, who will be the discussant for um, this book conversation. Sana is a researcher and a translator, and her research interests um, include gender studies, post-colonial studies, and critical race theory. Um, the book which we'll hear um, from uh, Malak in depth today is actually brings forward uh, thematics um, such, as, such as that of queer radical friendship, friendship and migration. And it tells the story of Ahmed, a queer bourgeois Tunisian, as he learns that he is HIV positive in, in the early 90s. Um, so this particular book launch will be in both English and French, and uh, we will do our best to ensure that uh, we translate uh, when need be. And uh, I also think that this book launch uh, is particularly special because we've really tried um, to ensure that this space becomes open to young authors as much as possible um, and to also fortify sort of the narratives um, that take place in the north of the continent and the south. So without further ado, I will open it up. Um, I'll open up the floor to Malak and after which we'll hear from Sana and then open up the floor for Q&A with the participants. So Malak, the floor is yours and uh, thank you so much for, for honoring and accepting our invitation. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you Amina for inviting me. I'm really, uh, I'm super excited about this, but I have to say before I begin, this is the first time I'm presenting my novel in English because indeed I will be speaking in English. I'll try to avoid French. <laughs> Um, and I'm a bit nervous because uh, I mean I've I've written it in in French, so I'm used to to talking about it in French. But this is like a new uh, a new way of doing it, and it, it really does make a difference actually in, in the way uh, I picture it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try talking about my novel uh, in uh, in English. So as you said, um, the novel is uh, tells the story of Ahmed who is a 30-something bourgeois uh, man in Tunis in the early 90s. And he finds out that he is HIV positive, which at the time kind of meant that, that he was going to die because there was no um, three ter th th therapy yet uh, that was introduced a bit later in, in that day, during that decade. Uh, and so this uh, news uh, puts him like, uh, makes him face uh, certain questions. So as he finds out that he has AIDS and that he will die, uh, he has to decide what he's going to do. And of course, in the context is a queer man uh, who has never really came out to his family and who's still somehow close to them uh, and who has to decide what he's going to do with himself um, without telling them that he has AIDS uh, and that he's going to die. And so the whole novel is kind of um, built around this question of silence and how tenable or untenable this silence is in the face of 
death, uh, to put it simply, as death will, will kind of, you know, cancels the whole like necessity of concealment and secrecy. And so the, um, in his, in his, it's a very reflective book. So he reflects a lot on whether he, what should he do and what, what he, what he eventually decides to do is that he's going to move back to Paris, um, where he used to live. And, um, and in Paris, there's his best friend who's also here and who herself from like given the choice to come back to Tunisia or go or stay in Paris has chosen to remain in Paris. And this launches a series of conversations and uh, questions about what to do with queerness and silence within a family. And the novel also uh, makes sure that everyone's voice is heard. So you can also hear not just Ahmed and his best friend Amal in Paris, but also uh, Ahmed's family, his brother, his mother, his father, as they um, kind of feel that something is shifting within him, but they cannot really tell what, and they cannot really speak to him about it. Um, and so, yeah, that's the story of the book. I'm not going to spoil you the end like that. That's already a good a good coverage. Um, but yeah, like this novel basically took me, I don't know, three years of my life. And um, and it was three years during which I had the opportunity to reflect a lot on family, on friendship. And that's some of the things I want to discuss um, today for this presentation. I hope I will not take too long, but that is just like some ideas I that really had what were important while I was writing and I, that I wanted to share with you. So the first thing for me, ironically, or not ironically, I don't know, but, uh, but for me, it was like the relationship to illness as an individual and as a family, because I have this very, like I have very vivid memories of my family dealing with illness, like keeping silent about it. Uh, to the person who's ill or like not telling us or someone who's going to die that they're going to die and telling them yeah it's going to be fine you're you're actually fine you have, you have nothing um and so i was really fascinated with where with the relationship of silence and how everyone is kind of you know equal participating in in silence and how that reproduces silences that are um that are produced in the context of good health, which can be silences about uh, family relations, about queerness, it can be silences about one's preferences or one's, um, you know, anything that can uh, lead to so sorts of disapprovals. And for me, the question of silences within a family um, has always been very important and something that I've really reflected a lot about. And, in, at the same time, and in a opposition, a direct opposition to that, to the question of silences within family, there is the the question of friendship and how friendships um, and the ability to talk to your friends about your family and you know compare and tell each other each other's stories and see oh well we're everyone is has the same shit going on. Um, for me, it has really been something very important, and it has really been uh, very important in the writing of this book, it, which who's in a certain way, uh, I would say, like a collective. Like it's not, of course, it's just me writing, and um, and there's my name on the cover at the end of the day. But it's also this book is also like the product a production of a lot of conversation, a lot of sharing, a lot of um mutual um I, I i don't like the word empowerment but mutual solidarity uh between groups of friends who um decided that maybe in order to feel less alone with whatever was going on with them as individuals and in the collective called the family they would share it with their friends and be honest about it and the help that these kind of friendships can provide um, of course, it's also a book about uh, queerness, uh, which for me, it was really important, if not like one of the most important things while writing this novel was to try to depict queerness in a way that um, not just goes against tropes, but tries to actually actively ignore them. And that means deconstructing things within myself as well. So to give you an example, I realized that 
the white gaze uh, was was upon me uh, when I was writing because I would I would feel I would sometimes write sentences that would have the like some uh, some expression like in this country and then an explanation about whatever that was uh, happening in this country and then I was like well who who am I explaining to is that is that white people I'm explaining to and so that that's one of the processes where you realize well whether you like it or not you you are um, haunted or uh, I, I'm, I'm reading Paulo Freire, Freire uh, right now and I really like his idea of the, the oppressed being the person that being an oppressed person is being uh, the host to somebody else in your mind um, and literally have someone uh, you know colonize or squat your mind um, and so for me it was important to see how I could uh, like go away from tropes and actually launch, create a space where queerness can be discussed outside of like very easy ideas of like, okay, so the Arab board is oppression, the West is liberation, uh, families are bad and queer people should um, emancipate themselves from their families. And so these kind of things that I kind of feel that I encountered a lot while reading books uh, on queerness. Well, not every single one of them, thank God for that actually. Um, but I felt that it was really important for me to like take these um, tropes seriously and not just go against them, but actually like actively think against them, not just give you know the opposite view or like some, often the opposite view can be like, awkwardly essentialist. So I was trying to think of um, other ways and like really just take seriously certain situations and and not just inhabit this space of like, oh, uh, he goes to Paris because that's where he can be free, you know? Like, no, that's not like, doesn't work like that. Like people don't um, don't just go to the West to be free like that. that that's, uh, that that's giving too much to white people. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, like one, one to, 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 to open up a bit the, the ground on the question of migration, because it's a big, it's a big thing in the book, like that you have two main characters who have, uh, like made dif very different choices and who are not really okay with the other person's choice, like coming back to Tunis or staying in Paris. And well, like none of them really likes Paris. Uh, or really likes life in the West, but they kind of um, made their different decisions and have to, you know, accept each other's decision. Um, and for me, it was important to, to um, like create a space where you can talk about migration in a very specific like class, which is the bourgeois class and how the bourgeois class is somehow um, meant to, being disconnected from its own society and connected towards the West. And then they go to the West and they're like, oh, we're racialized. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, and it, it's a very funny, like, when you think about it, it's very funny, like people who are full of privilege and fi suddenly find, go to the West where they think they belong and then suddenly they find themselves racialized and they're like, oh, you know, oh, wait, I'm not dominant here. That sucks. And, um, and so, yeah, I wanted to, ref to reflect on uh, bourgeois migration um, and, and choices, like the, mm -hmm. this I these, these ideas of like, where do you go? Where do you end up? Where do you want to live? Where do you belong? Obviously, like that's, I, I, I don't know. I think that's the main question uh, a lot of people ask themselves at the end of the day, um, or at least a lot of people who are like, you know, in situations of in-betweenness. Um, and I wanted, yeah, I wanted to just like, I don't know, really dig deep into these questions of migration and choice uh, in a context where the trope wants that, um, of course, like Africans uh, are all, all want to go live in Paris and have their best life there. And the book is really about questioning that, like they're, none of the characters is a big fan of um, living in a Western city, neither am I actually. Um, and I have a lot of experience with that, the bad experience, I guess. Um, and yeah, maybe like the, the, the last thing I want, wanted to uh, talk about here, because I, I really like the idea of um, 
having a, a space where we can talk about African literature and creation within like somehow outside the where where culture is usually discussed which is kind of western spaces and for me it's an opportunity to talk about echoes so I'm, 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 I'm someone who for years, um, for the last few years at least, decided to like situate her readings. Like I stopped reading Man, for instance. Um, most, most like, yeah, uh, yeah, Man, man, man novels I, I stopped reading. Um, and I, I, tr I read a lot more African and Arab writers. I make a point of reading more of those. And for me, it, it, it's very important to, read books and feel seen and feel um, feel that someone has thought of the situation where you're in or something that you felt and you feel like somebody is saw that and is talking about that and so I I uh, this book is very inspired by things I read and I'm specifically here um, I'm gonna gonna like uh i guess like quote not quote but like um talk about uh there's a algerian psycho psychoanalyst called karim alazali whose work uh has recently been translated to english that i really appreciate it's called the colonial trauma and her first chapter has been life-changing um like when i read it i was like okay this is the first time i'm ever reading someone talking about certain I, I don't know I, I don't know how to explain what she talks about but it, it's it's life-changing and it, it felt it felt powerful to be inspired by somebody else's writing in a very different discipline which is the discipline of psychoanalysis god knows that's an obscure land um uh, and for me it was really important to hear to to hear the echoes and to kind of prolonge the conversation that she started there's also uh leonora miano who's a Cameroonese writer. She's not widely translated in English, I would say. At least the work I'm specifically thinking of, which is called uh, Crépuscule mm -hmm. du Tourment, is uh, has not has unfortunately not been translated to English. Um, and it's a book that really goes uh, deep, del delves deep into uh, what it's like to be uh, an African bourgeois in uh, an, a kind of, of self hater. Um, and that has been, for me, a really helpful book to reflect on uh, belonging and unbelonging within that class. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that she is actually like, you know, very openly uh, despising the class. Um, and, and lastly, there's also Rabia Alameddin, who uh, wrote a novel called Cool Aids. He writes in English, he's a Lebanese writer. And um, his his work has really been very, um, I don't know, helpful for me because he is, I, to my knowledge, he's the only Arab writer who's written about AIDS so far. Or maybe I haven't read enough, but like he, he's at least the one guy I, 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 uh, I didn't raise my hand. I don't know if it's that thing. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, uh, his his work on AIDS, uh, and he his uh, he's talking about like AIDS in the context of Lebanon and San Francisco in the eighties, and that has really been something that is um, that that has you know like echoed what I wrote, and I'm talking about echoes here because I think one of the goals for me of writing is um to open doors or like i like i like the feeling of having doors open to me and i appreciate i love you know when somebody opens the door to me i'm uh i i, I like i like going for it and like kind of pursuing whatever i read and i have the hope um that as i have been inspired by echoes myself i um this is the kind of work who will echo with uh, other people. And I'm thinking really of like uh, non-white queer people uh, to, to kind of prolonge pro the conversation. So I think that's it for me. I hope I haven't been too long. Not at all. Thank you so much, uh, Malak, for this 
really wonderful elaboration uh, on your book and also the people you're thinking with. I think having a constellation of, of who someone is writing with and who and what someone is writing against um, really grounds us as readers to perhaps project ourselves into um, the effective experience of, of going through the book. And um, I just want to open up the floor immediately to Sana to, to, to tell us uh, about her, her part of, of having experienced the book and maybe uh, bringing forward this effective uh, sort of experience to, to it. Sana, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amina. And thank you, Malak, for the very rich introduction. Uh, I feel like you stole some of my ideas about <laughs> your own book. Uh, <laughs> but um, yes, definitely your book does echo with a lot of people uh, from my own. Like it means a lot to me on a personal, political and literary levels. Um, and it has been nice to be part of a shared experience that is literary with a community that goes uh, beyond like kind of where I'm located. I've sent it and exchanged about it with multiple people and it's been nice to kind of feel, feel seen and sometimes scary how much we feel seen through the book. Um, so thank you for writing uh, something that feels very vulnerable and very close to us uh, on many levels. You've already, you've already started talking about uh, a lot of themes that I wanted to bring up. Um, so I'm gonna start with kind of a general uh, conversation perhaps around uh, writing queer narratives from the global south uh, and then I have more questions that are more specific to the novel. Um, so one of my favorite aspects uh, about the way you wrote your novel is that it does not simply fall into those dominant tropes that you talked about. Um, so you do not write about queerness simply uh, through the lens of like tragedy uh, or victimhood. Uh, you actually discuss joy, family, friendship, illness, uh, desire. Uh, you build nuanced characters who are queer, but who are also experiencing life fully with all its complexities. Um, at the same time, uh, we know that queer stories from the global south are often instrumentalized uh, by racist politics, uh, as you've mentioned before and at times used to justify um, racist and imperialist actions. Um, actually, in your novel, I really like the part where uh, Amel, uh, the best friend of the main character, Ahmed, who is also a Tunisian queer migrant living in Paris, she felt this underlying racist pressure to denounce her parents. Uh, whenever her, her people would ask her in Paris about her parents, she felt this pressure to say, or to answer uh, that they are simply conservative Arabs, um, which in the French imaginary translates to, and this is a direct quote from your novel, Arabs, conservative, backward, Islam, don't like modernity, forced marriages, violence, a girl like us, French without an accent, free woman, drinks alcohol, does not say no to pork sausage. Uh, I really like this part because I feel like you have this unique capacity to be poignantly funny and political at the same time. So my question about all of these um, nuances, I guess, is how do we write queer narratives from the global south when we are often trapped uh, on one hand by these limiting tropes and on the other by the instrumentalization of our own narratives? Um, so it's a Thank you for this question because I've I've been asking myself this question for uh, a long 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 time, and um, I think what 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 I would say is that um, I, I recall a, a mem I have a, me a very close memory of a moment with a with, with a friend we have in common who's Kautar uh, Shakshar who's also one of the co-founders of Asamina. And I remember like having, taking a walk with her at some point, like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something and be like, um, so apparently, because she, she's also a writer and she's an excellent writer, by the way, her first novel is not out yet. It's not over yet, but it's like one of the best things that you'll read in your life. Um, just wait for it. And mm -hmm. I remember talking to her like, yeah, apparently, uh, 
we can't really afford to talk about stars and rivers and like how nice the the night looks and all of that and she was like yeah i, I guess so we, we really cannot afford it um and i think yeah that that's that is the realization that you have to stick to which is you cannot um you as a person coming from the south as a writer mm -hmm. you simply cannot afford uh, to ignore politics whether it is in your own writing or whether it is uh, in the way you perceive yourself in the market of writing or all any of that but like really you simply cannot afford uh, ignoring politics and maybe i'm saying that from a very specific point of view of someone who's also a, a researcher in political science so Maybe it's like a, a deformation professionnelle, but um, but for me, yeah, like right, the 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 I have a my opinion about like what to how to deal basically with uh, the positionality of being uh, someone who writes about queerness in the South is that I don't really know how it works, but you cannot ignore politics, you cannot ignore uh, the tropes, you cannot ignore. Um, reception mm -hmm. of, of uh, works, you have to be very observant of what is happening in the scene and how certain authors are received and not received and well received or not well received. And it, it's like, it's like a double job or like a double burden, you you have, like, you not only have to, you know, do the creative work, but you simply cannot afford to think of yourself as just a writer out there with a, like, uh, who believes in literature with a capital L. Like, I don't, I don't believe in literature with a capital L. I believe in um, situated, uh, situated tool of power. And, um, and you have to, you have to deal with the dangers of that. And for me, there's a responsibility, um, to, um, I, I mean, it, it's a painful responsibility, honestly, to actually um, like being uh, kind of deprived of this, you know, like the tranquility of being the writer, uh, the, 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 the writer of literature and not caring about anything politics and being so beyond that. No, I, it, it's, it's easy, like it's something white men can afford, I guess, and not even them anymore. Like, <laughs> thank God, actually. But uh, but as, as someone from the South, you you simply cannot afford it. And I don't believe in like, um, you know, being uh, like being a, a writer with a capital W or whatever. All all of these capital letters don't like just. And so yeah, for me, it's like a deep awareness of everything it encompasses while writing and afterwards and it can be i think it can be extremely tiring and it is it's not it can be it is it is extremely tiring uh but i i honestly think i cannot afford to like close my eyes and and hope that everything will go for the best uh in writing like we're all constructed we're all like going against currents and things like that so you just cannot afford it so politics <laughs> Yeah, that makes uh, total sense. And actually, maybe I do have a follow-up question about this. Is Since your book was written in French and was published originally in France, um, how has it been received and how is it circulated and discussed um, mm. in the Western context or perhaps in the French context? So it's, it's interesting because... Um, like that's something I was really think afraid of. Like, I mean, France is a very racist country. Mm. Um, and... and the good thing is that it has not circulated a lot, which is kind of like you know, uh, like uh, limits the, uh, the the potential of like explosion, which I was really afraid of, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find interesting is that it's circulating as a gay book, and for me, it's not like it's not ideal. But at the same time, I do recognize um, the importance of it being a gay book. Um, a gay male book, I guess. And mm -hmm. it, it's it's an interesting kind of reception because I think it kind of echoes a lot a, a, a lot with gay people in general. And I hope it, it echoes with like gay people in like diasporic gay people, non-white gay people in France. Um, 
And yeah, like I, I was really afraid, honestly, like I, I don't, I, I, I have seen like, I'm in in the in the the context of SME now. We have really worked a lot and and reflected a lot on what it means to to write in French, to publish in France, and we have the choice or not, or should we publish in France? Like honestly, I I I, I do hope that we will uh, we will afford to live in a world where we can actually stop publishing in France. Like that that is political objective. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In in the the circumstances uh, like of this of this novel, it was it was uh, made difficult. But uh, but yeah, like it, it's it's something that you cannot really escape. And so the best you can do is like try to you know like have your guns out and look for mm -hmm. look for trouble. <laughs> I mean, it is a, a a big burden to carry because you're not only responsible of what you write, but who reads it and how it's read and how it's interpreted, which as, as you've said, it is a particular burden that I feel like in today's political climate, let's say, queers of color uh, as authors or as creators in general carry uh, more than others um, to a certain extent. Um, so maybe also uh, within the same realm, um, do you think of fiction or um, fiction writing and building kind of through imaginations uh, as a tool of perhaps a queer non-white resistance? I I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I think fiction is, um, is a tool of, of, I don't know if it's a tool of resistance. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a tool of, uh, maybe reflection, maybe liberation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I honestly, I, honest, I honestly don't know. Like I, I, it's like when somebody calls me an activist, like what, what am I doing to be called an activist? No, like I'm not, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, and so for me, like it, what, what I would say is that fiction is very powerful and there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of questioning about what deserves fiction and, um like th there's I, I feel like there's a it's something i've been thinking about recently is that marginalized people in general are at least in in the the context where i'm in which is in tunisia they're often like um depicted through documentaries like it's very mm -hmm. raw documentaries and like what what does what room does that leave to fiction and for me fic i i i really believe i, I mean i do documentaries as well but i really do believe in the power of fiction and the freedom that it grants you um, to build things the way you want to build them and to say whatever you want to say in there and to pass messages through emotions or like I don't I, I don't know if emotions are passing or not in my book but um, but it's it's a powerful tool uh, that I think in itself needs to be grabbed and like re literally like uh robbed um from uh from anyone power powerful like it's something we need to appropriate and po appropriate politically not just appropriate dreaming of being like artists and writers and whatever like really appropriate with thoughts of power behind it and thoughts of politics but again, like that might be my my deformation as a political scientist. Uh, I think that's a very powerful sentence uh, to rob fiction and to reappropriate it and bring the political back into fiction, but also recognize that fiction, whether it does recognize itself as political or not, is somehow always political. Um, but it depends about who is speaking and who it's who it's speaking to um, that makes it pass as political or not, uh, meaning that a lot of the time when works of literature are produced uh, by people who are underrepresented communities, uh, it is often only seen also as a manifesto, um, as a political manifesto, and it's kind of also rid of uh, the imagination that goes into it, the creativity that goes into it, uh, and the literary tools that go into it, uh, because in your book there's, I'm really like fascinated by the literary craft. I think you write very vivid descriptions. Um, you write with a lot of humor. 
um, and you're also political. Um, so I think the fact that you worked to present characters that are nuanced is really reflected in your writing as well. I think your writing is also very nuanced. Uh, it does not, it always, it kind of always surprises you. It's not always what you expect it to be. Uh, and it definitely does make me giggle a lot. <laughs> so maybe I will ask you a more fun question about this because I've been <laughs> curious about it. Um, there's a lot of themes that we can go into. So Amina, you can let us know how much time we have because I could talk about this for the rest of the evening, but I know people have things to do. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about like food and music uh, because mm -hmm. I feel like it is often described within the novel as like, a way of building community, as a way of belonging, uh, especially there was a scene that really like uh, stuck with me, which is the description of Ahmed and Amal cooking shrimps with tomato sauce in a small studio in Paris and uh, listening to Najat Sagira. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, what place does music and food and music occupy for you in the novel um, and why these vivid descriptions? And also perhaps if you could recommend a dish and a song that we could pair with your novel, <laughs> what would you recommend? Um, so the the relation to food and music, honestly, it, it's something that I it has a lot to do with migration. I mean, obviously, like food mm -hmm. and music are always there, but like I feel like when you're in situations of migration, when when you're like for, for, in my case, like being an Arab in, abroad, uh, whether it is in France or elsewhere, like the 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 feeling of um, I don't know how how do you say it? like homesickness. Of course, mm -hmm. that kicks in a lot, and and for me like um, like pasta with shrimps, for example, uh, it's it's a very like it's a very real episode. Like it's something that I've taken out from my own life. It's like me with a friend and me cooking the pasta with shrimps, and I, I cooking it like my mother, you know. And I usually I would I would. Um, I would not be as good as my mom, but eventually at some point, I remember a very precise evening in Paris where I actually tried my pasta and I was like, okay, this is my mom's level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, like for, for me, I mean, it's, it's trivial, but at the same time, I have such vivid memories of so many evenings cooking like our food and listening to our music and feeling home. Um, and sharing that, like, it's not just something you do on your own. It's really like, um, like such a powerful way of gathering um, around a table with some food and the possibility of humming a song uh, that everyone knows. I'm really fascinated by how uh, in the Arab world, certain songs from a certain age are simply known by everyone like no matter who no matter what age you can you you realize like at, at least in my case i realized i know i knew the lyrics of so many songs of Fairuz, um kalthum najit sahira what have you without even having like remembered learning them uh, at any point in my life i just knew them and I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by the fact that whenever you listen to Um Kalthum in a cafe, everybody can start humming. Mm -hmm. And in the in the in the context of uh, exile and migration, this is all the more powerful. Mm -hmm. Like even like I I don't know. I remember like going to concerts where like I don't know Hindi Zahra concerts and like like you would recognize Arabs because they were like Izartu. Uh, uh, I don't know how to how to say that in English, obviously, um, but uh, but I, I I felt like there, there's a lot of belonging in and and tools to create belonging when you're abroad that I'm really so I have so much tenderness for honestly, and if I'm gonna associate my book with I I I don't know with a dish like uh, there is one dish in your acknowledgement page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the name of my cat. <laughs> okay, so you named your cat after the dish. Yes. Uh, no, actually, uh, I would say like to to I would associate my book with um, Tunisian pasta, uh, which is uh, very red. Uh, either you put chicken or like meatballs in there, or shrimps, or or fish actually but just like um, that and I guess yeah 
any Najat Sarira song, like could be Bahla Mak. I, I really like that song. Thank you. Um, I will. I will have to reread some passages while um, making Tunisian pasta. <laughs> um, so I will give the floor to Amina because she wants to open up uh, the floor for Q and A's. Um, thank you, Malek, for this rich discussion. And I mean, I'm around. Um, I still have many more questions. <laughs> thank you, Amina. No, no. Thank you, Sena, and thank you, Malak. Actually, I just wanted to perhaps make it a much broader conversation yeah, by bringing course. in more participants. Um, so if anyone has a question, feel free to send it in the chat and we'll be able to read it. And um, Malak will also be able to read it and perhaps we can continue the conversation um, in that sense. Um, so in the meantime, perhaps I can also just shoot in a little question and then um, Malak allow you to elaborate further on it. So I was really curious, um, you spoke about, you know, this, the story is on silence and how that silence is mediated. And I was curious about the title, about this idea of in valse, like a waltz uh, of silences. And it made me think about motion, like how silence moves. And I was really wondering, uh, what were your thoughts behind that? Like, does silence transform? Uh, how is silence enunciated uh, through the gaze? Uh, or how is when is it actually absent in the context of the story of the novel? Um, yeah, and just a waltz made me think of something that oscillates, like something that goes back and form, back and forth. Um, so I was really curious about that. Um, yeah, I like I like the way you see it. Honestly, I I, um, I I didn't really think about it that way. But I'm really all, uh, very curious about how people like translate or imagine certain things. And I really like the idea of oscillation and like the the silence traveling around because it's, there's definitely that um, in this case because the. Silence is not just within the family, it's also between friends, it's also like between brothers, it's it's a bit, it's silence with the self also, like there's a lot of silence within the beings themselves, they're like lying to themselves. And for me, this idea of valse is like more of a it's collective, it's like everyone's doing it and the harmony out of it is because everyone's doing it at the same time, they have the same moves and they, they um, there's a, there's an understanding. There is something that is calculated about it. Everyone knows what move to do. There is like silent instructions, and everybody's following them. Um, and that that's what it kind of evoked for me. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I think I I can see. Yeah, I can see how that married marries and uh, what you were talking with earlier and um I also had one final question uh around what kind of things did you have to let go of in the writing process uh or in in writing the story because often when we I guess when we deal with publishing houses I don't know how the process was or with Asians there are compromises that perhaps have to be done um so I was really curious about what didn't what didn't make it um to the final version of the book? uh curiously uh the, the title my title didn't make it <laughs> uh i mean this is also my title but uh but my, my I, I had a first title which i liked best honestly uh it was uh it was called sur la pointe des pieds uh so on i don't know how to say that like on the tiptoes or something like that um but no, uh, in in uh, in the, the, actually the the publishing house was really enthusiastic about the book, and they uh, they they told me, oh, it's perfect as it is. You shouldn't change anything. And I actually, interestingly, I was I did not agree. Um, the version I sent them, um, I was eventually not really happy with it, and so I asked. I actually told them, yeah, like, and th thank you for liking it, but I'm gonna change that. And I, I gathered a group of friends, <laughs> a very, very, very critical and uh, amazing friends uh, around in, in this very room. And they were supposed to tell me everything that they think is wrong with this novel. And they did. Um, 
And so they, I changed it according to their uh, to their uh, opinions. And I think that's that's the that got the text to be a lot better and a lot less, um, I don't know, depressing. I mean, it, it's a very depressing book, like disclaimer. Uh, but uh, but yeah, like actually the the what, what what surprisingly happened is that I asked for the book to be edited and I edited it. But the publishing house was actually per happy with everything. Uh, they were very supportive, and they were like, "Yeah, it's just great as it is." Uh, but uh, I, I was uh, I was being uh, already critical of myself. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. I love this idea of bringing people into yeah a room and just I, I think it says so much about um, maybe humility and writing and. I think sometimes we tend to be very protective of what we write. Um, and um, I think that yeah, shows- I cried. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> that must have been a, yeah, quite a confrontational mm -hmm. exercise, but also fruitful as it um, blossomed into this uh, piece of, of work. Um, Sana, I would love to open it back to you if you have if there's any other question that you want to to mm -hmm. ask uh, Malak, please feel free. And we're also just um, opening opening the Q and A. So if anyone has a question, please send it in the chat. Um, Malak is here to to engage as well. Thank you, Amina, uh, and thank you for your questions. Um, I think it's really interesting to see your approach, Malak, and like building a space of co-creation um, because it's, it is important to you. And we can see that through the writing and through the way you present your book and through how you want your book to be received and read that you always kind of keep in mind this idea of having a shared space of co-creation, like you've said before, um, a space also of solidarity uh, rather than empowerment. So I did want to ask about that and about friendship and queer friendship, uh, which you've mentioned in the beginning. Uh, because I think what's interesting here is that this was not only about friendship, but it was about a very particular kind of friendship. It's a queer friendship. It's a migrant friendship. It's a exiled friendship. Um, and we see how Aman and Ahmed kind of invite us to think about what community means and how we can build community and what does solidarity look like, even though they don't necessarily agree on a lot of things and on their own approach to being abroad, their own approach to their queerness, to their family relationships. Um, so can you tell us a bit more of like, why was it important for you to depict queer friendship in this way uh, that is both central and nuanced? Um, and yeah, I'll go and I'll have a follow-up question after. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think for me, like friendship is uh, something that has always been central, like, and I couldn't think of writing a book um, that mm -hmm. dealt with these issues without the space for friendship. Mm -hmm. um, because you, for me, it's re like, I, 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 as I see it, like, I do wonder sometimes if maybe like the, the friendship, queer friendships are not even like as important as queer relationships themselves. Like mm -hmm. the, 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 the co-building of like perception or the co-building of one's acceptance of the self, uh, which is really something that like is being, is what happens between Amel and um, Ahmed. So they, they kind of met in at university um, mm -hmm. and kind of started, you know, like building their friendship about, around the fact that they were both queer. And for me, like there is something that has really been like it is it's incredible about the, the potentialities of friendship in seeing yourself, especially when you come from spaces generally family spaces where you you're not really visible or you or only like certain parts of you can be visible and other not mm -hmm. and the idea of like being um a witness for each other like friendship is a lot of witnessing i feel like my relationships i i mean i have i have friends uh, <laughs> uh just for the info but i have like, no, but, like 
it, it's interesting because like I've always moved a lot in my life and for the first time in my life I'm, I'm, I have friends that are more than 10 years old like friendships that are more than 10 years old and it's incredible when you think about it the, the how friendship uh, after a certain time becomes like some sort of archive like the friends kind of become archi archivists of your yourself and like you remember when you used to be like that and uh, you remember when you fucked up like that and it is really interesting for me how you how you build and you continue to build throughout the years different relationships like the friends I'm talking about who are the friends who, who, who I gave the, the the novel in its initial versions to read and told them like okay like it's time to be mean now um, they uh, they they have been around for a long time and um, it's it's something like I I don't see self construction or like self um, anything without the interaction that you have with loy with. The loyalty and solidarity and the, the the certainty of having people there's a french expression that i really like about that which is how like être dans le même bateau ou, like being in the same boat basically like for me that's mm -hmm. like that's what friendship is about it's like having people in your on your boat and being the same boat and just knowing that this boat will like you know roll on for like a long time mm -hmm. yeah. um i think someone has a question uh, yes, um, Nabil, could you please um, turn on your camera and unmute so that we can, um, so that you can ask your question. Hello? I think Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Amina. Thanks, Malik, for uh, your wonderful presentation. Uh, I have just uh, a question concerning the, the process of writing. Uh, uh, your, 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 your profile as a writer and a researcher uh, who writes literature. Uh, uh, like, what are the works that inspire your work uh, of fiction? Like, uh, I see like it's a Maghribi literature. It's like a contribution to contemporary Maghribi literature written in French uh, uh, that, that are uh, inspiring work. Uh, at the same time, I wonder what... Nabil, I think your connection is a bit unstable. We might have lost two. Um, so if you could type it in the chat, but I think we heard the first halt. So maybe we can, yeah, work with that. Yeah, so the inspirations, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the second half of the question though. Um, the, the inspirations, like for, for me, as I mentioned, there's uh, Karim Alazali, Leonora Miano, Rabia Alameddin, there's a, a lot of other people. Like, um, I, I wouldn't like, I, I so many books uh, that inspired me, but when, when thinking of Maghrebi literature, um, I, I have a very like, um, I don't know, a special relationship with Maghrebi literature. Um, uh, hello, sorry, I have been, yeah. I've been ousted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, how do you, uh, uh, to, to continue my statement, Tarban Jlun was said that the language of Arabic is the language of Quran, and writing in French is more liberating to speak of taboos that you can't tell in Arabic. What, what, what can you say about this? Like, how agree. do you express <laughs> writing in French? I don't agree. That's what I can say about it. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that Arabic is like uh, too sacred a language to talk about. I, I also question the question, the, 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 the concept of taboo. Like, I don't think French is more liberating than Arabic or like yeah. very liberating books in Arabic. And I think it's very, like, sorry to say, it's very colonial to think that French is more liberating than anything. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, this 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 comes with Al Khatib's uh, double critique and his writing in French and uh, think uh, uh, like uh, his novel uh, uh, "Loving Two Languages." So it's it's the same thing, like writing two languages at the same time, like, like a tongue. 
Yeah, the, the question of languages is extremely, uh, is extreme, like it, it's something that has always been in my mind. Like I know that I write in French and I cannot write in Arabic um, and I cannot write in English either. Uh, I know French is the language I master the best. So I don't have like, it's it's the one language that I will write in and I think I'll continue writing in it. Um, but I do, I'm obviously aware of like why I do speak French and why I do write in French. Uh, it's for very nasty colonial reasons. And for me, it doesn't change, um, like the fact that I'm writing in French uh, does not make my work instantly colonial. Like, I don't like this whole, like, oh, right, writers in French are just colonized. Like, obviously, like, I think it's a bit easy to think that. Um, but at the same time, yeah, of, like, you cannot ignore, uh, even in terms of reception, like, who's going to read your book uh, when you write it in French? Like, I know that in Tunisia, who's going to read my book is... Uh, it's a very classed public, a very, uh, it's not even young people anymore because they read in English, but th things as they are make it impossible for me to, to, to write in another language yet, or I don't know. And, but it's still something that you, that you have to fight with, within yourself, within the, the gazes that you hold within yourself. Um, and I obviously don't think that there is, um, like for me, it's not like, it's something that I, I need to think about politically, but at the same time, it's not a language that I'm gonna dismiss and it's not a language that I'm gonna put on a pedestal thinking that it's more liberatory. Um, it's just a language that got to me for very problematic reasons and I keep using it, but I'm not gonna give it up or, or put it on a pedestal for these reasons. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, response, Malak. Thank you for your question, Nabil. Glad uh, we were able to hear it, the last part. Um, we've come to 5 p.m. CST, 4 p.m. here in Morocco. Um, so I'm I'm happy to extend for like another 10 minutes if Sana, you feel like you have um, other questions that you may want to add or Malak, if there is a specific point that you want to elaborate further on. Um, but this has really been such an, a wonderful and fruitful conversation that I think has expanded my desire and I hope everyone's desire to read uh, your book in French. Um, Vals de Silence. Um, so, yeah, Sana, do, do you want to add a last question before we wrap up? Uh, sure, as I've said, I can go on endlessly. Um, but I will uh, ask just one last question because I was very curious um, to see a word that was used repetitively at different points throughout the novel. And I was wondering why is that? And the word is maktoub. Uh, which can be translated in English to like fate or destiny. Um, so why is Maktoub uh, very present and seems to haunt a lot of the characters? <laughs> um, I think it, it's it's there because it's something that is um, that I associate a lot with family, like this uh, kind of dictation that family kind of um, can um, produce and reproduce like this idea of uh, uh, like it's it's all written it's already there you don't change you resemble your aunt or you have the same personality as your father like there is this whole like uh, kind of Li linear slash like very rigid um, way of seeing people and seeing events that can be very reassuring. For example, in the case of illness, and I use maktub in the case of, in the, the, the context of illness, maktub is a very easy way to dismiss um, what you could have done to like, uh, like mitigate the effects of, of a certain illness, like for example, cancer or things like that. Um, but yeah, it's for me, it's a very important, like it's, it's that's how I picture a certain aspect of families um, that can be very rigid and very like, um, uh, 
how do you say it was like uh, tiny in a certain sense like that 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 it's tightening you it doesn't leave much space for people and yeah like it, it it's one of these expressions of course i'm not gonna like disclaimer this is not about like rejection of religion or anything like that like uh <laughs> but uh but yeah like for me it's a, it's a, it's it's much more of a social word than it is a religious word. And it's the mm -hmm. social meaning of it and the, the social use of it that I, I, I found, find like excruciating sometimes. And I really wanted to, to put that propaganda against it uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I think it's because you put it in conversation with silence and we see how like both silences and maktub are used um, at different points of the book to kind of police people's behaviors, to police their thoughts, to police their feelings. Uh, so I see how the two ki kind of go together and complement um, each other uh, throughout the book. Um, so, oh, I think I see a question uh, in the chat by Nabil. Uh, can, you, can you see yeah. that? I can read it if you want. Read it. So uh, Nabil is asking, in which ways can writing fiction undo the maktoub, uh, which is what is written metaphorically? I think writing is the best way to undo that because the the freedom it allows you is uh, is uh, another level. Like when I compare it to writing academic research, for example, mm -hmm. I, I uh, the 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 freedom you have when you write fiction, um, what you can do with the characters, what you can think about, where you can go, is uh, is something that definitely like. Kind of uh, destroys the maktub from from inside, you know. Like you can't really write. Uh, ironically, maktub being translatable as some what is written, you can't really write maktub because you're choosing. It's pretty written. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much uh, for for this beautiful ending. And Malak, I really loved what you said uh, in terms of this idea of reading books and feeling seen. And I remember uh, this uh, friend of ours called Sabello uh, once gave us a keynote and, and said, you know, when, when trying to read or when reading critical work or any kind of work, um, we should ask ourselves whether that person who wrote it thought about us uh, or thought about me as an individual, as a human being, and what kind of um, mm -hmm. sort of politics relates me to that person or to that writer. And I, and I think this notion of, yeah, invoking or disrupting Mektoub and, and, and having sort of a clear epistemic stance in terms of who you're writing against um, and who you're writing for um, is, is so important. So I'm really grateful we got to hear a lot from you about uh, the book and that Sana uh, joined us and, and we got to hear you speak uh, both about um, the unfolding of this big project um, or this big baby and I don't know why I call it baby but yeah you see what I mean um, it's a long baby <laughs> <laughs> disrupting the dimensions of <laughs> yeah um thank you so much to everyone who've joined us um and we're really looking forward to having you join us again for our other uh human seminars that are happening throughout this week um so um on wednesday we actually have uh, minga congo dr congo speak to us about doing his research um in kailisha in south africa and how water um plays has play the central role or trope um, in his research. Um, we have Josiane Tanchou uh, coming to speak on the hospital of tomorrow on Thursday. And next Wednesday, we have Veli Mitova on decolonizing experts for our African epistemology series. So all of these can be found on the HUMA calendar um, on, our, on the website. Um, so feel free to join in and yeah I just want to say thank you to you Malek uh, to Sana and to Divine for um, helping us with the logistics and to also my colleagues who are here present and um, I hope we can continue the conversation at some point in person in, in physical 
um, form and that we can all meet. Uh, but in the meantime, we're here on, on virtual screens. Um, thank you guys. Thank you very thank much. You.